The American Physical Society's 2023 March meeting brings together scientists and students from around the world to connect and collaborate across academia, industry and major labs. Whether you're in person or joining us virtually, the APS March meeting is well underway. Visitors from all over the world are gathering for their opportunity to share their research, network with their peers and learn about current issues relevant to the physics community. Welcome back to APS TV and the third thrilling day from the APS 2023 March meeting. I'm your host Stephen Horn, and today we shift our focus to all things publishing. Margaret Gardell, lead editor of PRX Life and Serena Brade, managing editor of PRX Life, introduce APS's new peer-reviewed journal PRX Life. Jessica Thomas, APS Executive Editor, highlights the legacy, relevance and editorial excellence of the physical review journals and explains what sets them apart from other journals. Rachel Burley, APS CPO, outlines the increasingly competitive and open scientific publishing landscape and how her team is positioning APS's journals to continue to serve the physics community for many years to come. Today we dream big. Well, small dreams actually, in fact, very small dreams. We take a trip across the world exploring the scientific innovations in all things quantum. Each day you can find the latest episode of APS TV on the TVs placed around the convention centre. But don't worry if you miss us there, you can tune in right in your hotel room, channel 71 at the Ling and the Horseshoe Hotel, and channel 74 at Harris. Remember, you can also find us on the APS website, as well as on YouTube and Twitter channels. Plenty of ways to watch. News of recent innovations have gotten us wondering, what does the future of the internet look like? The Centre for Quantum Networks and their groundbreaking work towards building the quantum internet promises to revolutionise the way we communicate. Let's check it out. The Centre for Quantum Networks is aiming to build the quantum internet, the internet of the future, which will be able to communicate qubits packets of quantum bits of information from one computer to another. We're really hoping for some huge benefits in communication security, medical applications, the medical field, financial transactions. We've recruited what we call Quantum Society Fellows, and these are researchers across the whole world who have proposals that look at particular aspects of the way that one or more quantum technologies is going to affect society. The Center for Quantum Networks is the first organized effort in the country that brings together all of the disciplines and all of the know-how that will be necessary to build this entire stack of technology. CQN has the potential to be the effort that really for the first time develops the core technologies that are at the heart of the future quantum internet. We've seen how quantum technologies can revolutionize the way we communicate. How about the way we do chemistry or physics or even biology? The Center for Quantum Leaps at the Washington State University in St. Louis has the answers. The Center for Quantum Leaps is an interdisciplinary center and the purpose of the center is to connect those working in quantum technologies to the scientific questions that different researchers are pursuing at Washington University. And the goal is to find areas where quantum advantages, quantum technologies can really help drive advances forward in different research fields. Our center really focuses on developing those quantum technologies, expanding our understanding of quantum technologies, but also finding new places where those technologies can have impacts. We've created a center to really see what we can do with quantum sensing. What can we use this for in material science? What can we use this for in biology? Here, what we're thinking about is quantum information, quantum computing, and we've talked about quantum sensing here at Washington University. These areas are ways where we can enhance scientific discoveries by using and harnessing the special properties of quantum mechanics to do things that we hadn't even envisioned a decade or two ago.
We're joined now in the studio by the lead editor of PRX Life, Margaret Gardell, and managing editor Serena Brade to talk about the APS's newest peer-reviewed journal and just what this means for the physics community. First of all, thanks both for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So, Margaret, let's kick off. What is PRX Life? PRX Life is a new journal from the Physical Review family of journals that will be publishing articles at the interface of biology and physics. Can give us some idea of what those articles might be. Yeah, so we're really interested in reflecting the diversity of um, interests and research areas that are uh, representative of our biological physics community in, at American Physical Society. And this goes uh, across length scales um, from molecular structure and function of individual proteins all the way up to ecological dynamics. So Serena, where does PRX Life sit within the PRX family of journals? Well, we, we are open access and highly selective, like PRX Energy and Quantum, so we'll be sitting like very close to PRX, so we'll be accepting transfer from PRX and we'll be um, soliciting transfer to our sister journal and the open access channel is PRX uh, Physical Review Research. But all the, we'll be make sure that the manuscript will uh, uh, sit at the right uh, journal within the family. So we'll be making sure that the process is smooth as possible for others. And how about, how are you going to tackle peer review? On building on the reputation of PRX, so we'll be offering uh, a personalized and rigorous review process. Um, and the, the, the review process at the interface of physics and biology is sometimes difficult because uh, people have strong opinion on what biology and physics should be. So with the help of the lead editor and the board, uh, I hope to uh, make sure to reduce the biases and be as inclusive as possible and, uh, and uh, to make sure that the author's experience is as, uh, as, as uh, present as possible. It's an exciting time to be in an exciting field, isn't it? It's, it's great, yeah. There's been lots of um, really recent developments that have affected our ability to um, uh, gain lots of uh, quantitative information about biological living systems at all different scales. Um, and at the same time, uh, we also uh, have new tools, uh, computational and theoretical tools, to be able to distill down this, uh, these large data sets to be able to build predictive physical models. And I, I echo what she's saying, like, it's an exciting time to be a physicist working in biological system right now. So um, we are opening this journal to give validation to this field as a subfield of physics. So I hope that this is uh, something that this community will embrace and, and will publish with us. I'm sure they will. And thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And thank best you. of luck with it. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Now let's travel to Japan where the Centre for Quantum Information and Quantum Biology at Osaka University has become a flagship research centre and the largest centre of its kind in all of Japan. QIQB's research is based on the theory of quantum information, quantum estimation, quantum computation, quantum measurement and quantum chemistry. We are actively working on designing, building a large-scale fault-tolerant quantum computer and developing a new software approach to find a quantum advantage for practical application in the near future. Our group is investigating the application of quantum computing in the study of chemical reactions and the development of novel quantum algorithms for it. Quantum computers combined with quantum sensing could lead to new developments in drug discovery. We focus on using trapped ions for quantum computing. We are trying to develop a system using vibration degrees of freedom that enables exactly identical qubits and also high coherence. APS Executive Editor Jessica Thomas joins us in studio now to discuss how the distribution of scientific ideas is imperative to the advancement of physics research. First of all, thank you very much indeed for coming to join us today. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So let's start off. What distinguishes uh, physical review journals from other journals, competitors, shall we say? I think a lot of it is in the history. I mean, physical review started more than 100 years ago. Gosh. And in that time, right, uh, they've published uh, Nobel Prize winning 
research, groundbreaking results that kind of set the stage for research to come. But another big piece of it, I think, is how steeped in the research community the journals are. And that comes from being part of the American Physical Society, which is driven by its mission to you know, get research out there, and that's what the journals do. But it's also in um, how researchers contribute to the journals, both in, uh, you know, we're very lucky to have top scientists who contribute to the journals as editors, as leaders, as our, on our advisory boards, and I think that that lets us kind of both reflect how research is changing, the topics people are studying, and the voices that are emerging, but it also lets us influence it in a positive way. So, a lot of people here, obviously, and, and how, does a, how does somebody figure out, because it's, you've got quite a portfolio of titles within the family, how does people work out, you know, kind of how things overlap and where they should aim their article? Well, I think the overlap is important because there aren't sharp boundaries in research either between topics and sort of the way people pursue problems. Um, but, you know, I think a big piece of it is the audience that you're trying to reach. You know, are you trying to go for sort of more a community that's working on applications-oriented research? Are you trying to reach an audience that's, say, focused on design of materials? Are you trying to reach more of a fundamental physics audience? So that, you know, that's a, we want to offer as many options as possible to researchers. And I think, you know, one way uh, for, for a scientist to choose is, is to literally just take a look at the journals. What have they published recently? What flavor of, of research is kind of in a, a recent issue? But the other is, you know, ask. We, we, we would love to, we love to hear from researchers. Uh, we, we're happy to, to, you know, to guide and give advice about which is the appropriate journal. One of the things that, that grabs you when you're at this particular meeting, isn't it, is the internet, is the global scale of everything. And people are from all over, aren't they? And you reflect that as well in your in your journals, don't you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's more often than not that when a paper comes in, it has authors from multiple countries. And you know, as the journals kind of grow and evolve, we want to make sure we don't do anything that gets in the way of that sort of collaboration. I think you also see the international aspect of the journals kind of in, in who is contributing to them. So we rely on a very international pool of referees um, to advise on, on papers. Um, and we just announced our outstanding referees for 2023. Uh, there are 150 and they cover 30 different countries. Uh, so you, you can see the, the international aspect there. Um, but then, it's, you know, like I said, because we're part of the community, the people that are contributing to the journals as editors and on our advisory boards, they come from all over the world. And that's important because you want to be guided not only by their expertise, but also by where they are and what they're experiencing. My final question is, it's very obvious talking to you, Jessica, how passionate you are about, you know, what you're, you're doing. Why is that? Well, um, I think that academic research it has a kind of timeless quality to it but at the same time if you want to uh, really represent research and researchers you, you have to move with the times um, you know how are values changing in the research community and I find it fascinating a fascinating problem to connect that timeless quality to the need to evolve and, and change um, plus I think to do that well means talking to a lot of people and listening and uh, I love both of those things, and I love the personalities that come out of research because the people who do science are so excited by what they're doing. Um, they're very passionate, and that comes across pretty much in any conversation you have, and that makes, I think that makes the job a joy. Well, thank you very much indeed for joining us today. Really appreciate it, and, and good luck for the rest of the conference. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Quantum has made leaps and bounds and it's starting to really impact businesses. Let's take a closer look now at how Accenture is preparing businesses for both the benefits that quantum computers will bring as well as securing against the risks they introduce. Quantum computers have the potential to revolutionize a wide range of industries and Accenture is at the forefront of this technology. We focus on education, advisory, strategy on quantum, as well as quantum algorithms and applications. Quantum computing, communication, and sensing technologies offer unique capabilities that businesses are exploring to improve their ability to do machine learning, optimization, and chemistry problems. 
Our mission is to understand and contribute to the latest advances in these technologies and test them with real world problems. So Accenture is a steward and a pioneer in this future. We are embracing it wholeheartedly. We're testing it out. We're educating our workforce and our people on it and endeavor to help our customers, partners, and clients advance this field steadily and, and grow it respectfully forward. Based both in Cambridge, Massachusetts and Cambridge, UK, Riverlane is a company focused on making quantum computing useful by addressing one of its biggest challenges, error correction. Let's see how they do it. Qubits tend to be noisy and decohere very quickly. We cannot rely on them to carry out the calculation for the amount of time that is needed. What quantum error correction does is it takes these unruly qubits and turns them into something useful. If you don't solve error correction, then you'll never have a useful quantum computer. Back in uh, 2014, I was at a conference. A third of the audience voted that there would never be a useful quantum computer. I founded Riverlane because I think they're wrong. Riverlane's mission is to build an operating system for error-corrected quantum computers. We're building fast decoders, control systems that will scale to ultra-large numbers of qubits, and we're also working with hardware partners. My research group has been working on neutral atom quantum computing for the past 20 years. It's become very clear that to make further progress, we will also need error correction. We're looking to do that in part through a collaboration with Riverlane. I think we've got the right people, the right kind of skills, the prospect of us being a central part of the first error-corrected quantum computer is just amazing. Rachel Burley, APS Chief Publishing Officer, joins us to discuss how the APS journals are navigating the scientific landscape and how APS is staying ahead of the curve in the distribution of open science research. First of all, welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you, Stephen. How's the March meeting been going for you so far? You know, I think just the, sh the sheer scale of the event sort of takes your breath away. There's more than 12,000 people registered for the meeting. So that was the first thing that struck me. Um, I'm also really impressed with just the comprehensiveness of the program. There's so much going on, sort of from, really from sort of dawn until dusk, there's some event going on. So it's been quite hard to schedule everything that I want to join, but I've managed to fit a few things in. Um, and astonished really just by the organisation because, you know, the, the um, behind the scenes right. sort of work that's gone into organising an event like this is incredibly impressive. Now you're Chief Publications Officer, mm -hmm. uh, so give us a little bit of an idea of, of the remit, the sort of breadth of publications here at the APS. So I'm responsible for the physical review family of journals um, and of course that includes physical review letters and then there's the, the PRX fam journals that are um, part of that family and I'm responsible for the team that run those journals and of course everyone knows they've got um, a long history and right. of a prestigious legacy and so I feel entrusted with the brand. Um, and you know we're, we're growing the portfolio, so we're launching new journals. We're just launching PRX Life, in fact, at this meeting. So it's a comprehensive um, program, but a very high quality. And it's quality. essential to the mission of the APS, isn't it? Totally, yeah. I mean, uh, the journals are how the, the physicists communicate their research to the community and, um, you know, safeguarding those and ensuring that they grow and evolve with the, the communities that we serve is just uh, critical. Give us a little bit of a night. A lot of the, these meetings one goes to, we talk about open access. So it's kind of, how does open access work for physical review journals? Um, well, physicists are sort of very open, have been very open in general um, for, for many years. And in fact, the physical review journals had their first open access publication in 1998. Um, and in, in 2011, we introduced a hybrid option so that authors can publish open access individual articles in some of our biggest journals. So we've been um, open for quite some time and about a third of our papers last year were published gold open access in the journals. So but as everybody knows, it's growing, um, right? There's an increasing demand and need for open science and open access. And so we're keeping, keeping up with the trend. Final question is uh, when we look to the future, uh, what, what, what are the trends that you see and how do you see the APS journals developing? 
So I think the open access and open science is one of the major trends that's driving changes in the industry as a whole in academic publishing. So the Nelson memo that was just um, released in August last year, which is sort of asking uh, the federal agencies to have their own uh, public access policies, that will change uh, publishing behaviour. So I think in the future it's, we're looking for it to be more open and there's no question that that's going to be the case. Um, I think there's increasing pressure for efficiency in publishing, so people want to get published quickly. Um, there's pressure on the system in terms of the availability of peer reviewers, so I think finding ways to have an engaged peer review community is, is top of mind for us. Um, and then I think also just looking at how the next generation of physicists sort of read and consume scientific research and you know how we can serve them by looking at you know what is it that they're looking for us from next so just developing our portfolio to meet their needs great thanks ever so much for joining us hope you enjoy the rest of the conference rachel thank you thanks for having me the center for quantum engineering research and education at tcg crest is dedicated to cutting edge research in the emerging field of quantum engineering training future specialists for academia and industry from India and overseas. Let's go take a closer look. The objectives of the center are twofold. First, to pursue cutting edge research um, in quantum science and technology. And second, to provide high quality education to students and to train them to carry out research in this important area in the future. This is almost like the transistor revolution that we had seen you know, more than 50 years ago. So quantum brings a unique opportunity. The primary research area that has been pursued in SECURE at the moment is quantum computing, but we've taken initial steps to start research on quantum sensing and we plan to, to, to work on quantum communication in the future. Let's head to Singapore now, a country that's had world-leading expertise in basic science. It's now bringing together experts to create an ecosystem to foster the quantum technology that will change the world and help all of humankind. Singapore has been supporting basic science in quantum technology for a very long time. And then around 2018, the quantum engineering program got started. The quantum engineering program looks for projects that have a very clear application use case and you give them funding so that the technology readiness level can be increased. There's really a rich network of quantum researchers tackling all aspects of quantum technologies. Quantum ecosystem is very friendly and very supportive and uh, very open. We have talent, we have government support and funding, and also heightened awareness and interest in quantum technologies. Singapore has the kind of ecosystem that you need. It really felt like they were already waiting for quantum technologies companies to come up. What I hope to see is a lot more enterprises able to use what we have invested in quantum tech to benefit mankind. Up next, we head to the University of Massachusetts Lowell to learn about their cutting-edge Quest Group and the research they're doing with academic universities, industry and national labs. In Quest Group, which is Quantum Engineering Science and Technology Group, we work on developing systems which are macroscopic in size, but they can still manifest quantum effects which means that these systems are big enough that they can be controlled by us while manifesting delicate quantum effects. I work in theoretical cosmology. Uh, my interest is uh, at the interface of gravity and quantum mechanics. Uh, I want to understand how they inform us of the origin of the universe uh, and of the evolution of the universe. So for example, we think that quantum mechanics had a very important role in the early universe and how structure in the universe formed. We have very close collaborations and deep ties uh, with several industry partners uh, such as IBM Research and Raytheon BBM Technologies. This is an immense benefit to us both in terms of physics as well as student training. Specifically by talking continuously to people who are developing 
practical quantum technologies like IBM and Raytheon, it keeps us grounded and it also helps us identify the primary directions where we can make a real world impact. And so we hope that these will be the students of the next generation quantum smart workforce. The research focus of the Raytheon New Muscle Research Institute and the Printed Electronics Research Collaborative is to implement additive manufacturing in RF and microwave devices. As part of that, our strengths include the development of functional printable inks, additive packaging, textile electronics, and technology protection. Bernie and Perk are both uh, organizations that work uh, very closely with our corporate partners. Raytheon in particular, Aruri, is a co-located facility where Raytheon engineers, scientists work with our students and faculty. Ruri is unique because we have a facility here on the UMass Lowell campus where we can work side by side with professors and students and do that fundamental research that's harder to do in industry, mature that work and then bring it back to Raytheon. Through Ruri, we also get to work with PERC, which is building the supply chain for print and electronics to really develop that whole ecosystem. If there's one thing about the APS March meeting we can all agree on, it's that the experiences here can be truly life-changing. Let's take a walk now and hear about some of those valuable experiences. I've really enjoyed a lot of the talks that people have had. Uh, a lot of very smart people uh, telling about their research uh, in pretty simple ways that I've been able to understand as an undergraduate researcher. Uh, I've also really enjoyed the, uh, the, uh, the expo right here. Um, I've gotten a lot of insight from different companies on topics that I didn't really think I had any knowledge about, and I've, I've learned a lot here. As an industrial physicist, I do a lot of work in different areas and societies, but uh, physics is my uh, home. Uh, discipline, so uh, I enjoy seeing new things uh, that come out. Uh, this year, I've noticed there's a lot of quantum computing related booths in the exhibit hall, and that was kind of interesting. And uh, so, yeah, I, every year there's something different. I enjoy it. The good thing about Marsh Meeting is that you can talk to people who do quantum information, solid state physics, soft matter physics, and biological physics in one place. I usually come to Marsh Meeting to expand my network for collaboration, writing new papers, and I usually have fun at Marsh Meeting. Compared to other conferences that I've been to, there are a lot of topics, right? You can find anything that you want to, you know, talk about or think about. Um, there's a really friendly crowd here, right? And then they also have a lot of different events that are very inclusive to all the people that are in attendance. So it's a very inclusive place and it's, it's you can find everything that you want to do here. So Marsh Meeting, this is the first time I've been at like a large conference and it's a wonderful opportunity to meet new people and new scientists and all the companies that are here. It's cool to see such new scientific instruments and to listen to all the talks and to meet also other women in physics. I think APS, uh, as an early PhD student, so I just started out, it lets me get feedback like during my presentations and my posters from other early PhD students, but also maybe from postdocs and professors. And it's a great collaboration between a lot of uh, different varying skill levels and knowledge. And it's just a wonderful way to get some feedback on my topic. It's just really amazing how people uh, gather to discuss physics, to discuss science, innovation, technology. And yeah, I think that's one of the uh, important things that every student or every uh, professionals in the scientific field should do once in a year. It's once every year and uh, it's worth coming every year here to, to meet people and to discuss uh, about your physics projects. The Eindhoven Hendrik Casimir Institute brings together photonics, electronics and quantum technology to drive exponential computing, communication and sensing technologies for a sustainable information society. Let's take a visit and find out more. We are currently living in an information era where there is an exponential increase in data and um, information transfer and we are currently facing the limitation of uh, the electronics technology. So we are exploring new technologies to overcome this hurdle 
and quantum technology and photonics can offer a solution here. Not that they can fully replace the electronics technology which is currently widely being used, but that they contribute to the more sustainable society. Quantum is more up and coming and photonics is something that really enables quantum and if we can link them more closer we can actually make quantum technologies reality uh, much quicker than we could otherwise. Now is the time to work on those two different fields to connect those and our institute is the ideal environment to look for opportunities to connect those technologies. Quantum computing is truly game-changing to a wide range of fields. Let's head now to Total Energy, whose quantum computing team is focused on modelling the incredibly complex processes involved in carbon capture. We have to have a net zero society by 2050, and Total Energies is fully committed to this scenario. We need game-changing technologies in, in key areas, uh, such as carbon capture, for example, the key for carbon capture is finding the right material. We use machine learning to search new uh, family of materials made possible by really huge computing. We have facilities in Po, France, and uh, in Houston, Texas. And we also have a dedicated team that is specially working on quantum computing based in Saclay, close to Paris. We applied quantum computing to treat large unit cells of uh, materials such as metal organic frameworks and to probe these unit cells uh, of materials for their carbon capture capabilities. Ultimately, what we hope from quantum computing is to find uh, a better material in order to improve the capture process and enable its uh, deployment in the world. That brings us to the end of day three at the APS. We hope you've enjoyed our focus today on all things publishing. We paid visits to universities and institutes bringing visions of quantum technologies to reality. And we heard from the publications bringing that reality to you. Each day you can find the latest episode of APS TV on the TVs placed around the convention centre. But don't worry if you miss us there, you can tune in right in your hotel room, channel 71 at the Ling and the Horseshoe Hotel and channel 74 at Harris. Remember, you can also find us on the APS website as well as on YouTube and Twitter channels. Plenty of ways to watch Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you right back here tomorrow for more exciting news and highlights from the APS 2023 March meeting. We'll see you there.